All right, this is the title of the lesson. Um, we're going to try to run through this as quickly as possible. I have about 21 slides. The title should be self-explanatory. Um, going to try to run through this as quickly as possible because I've been on a research binger like for the past week. That's why I've been putting out lesson, 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 lesson. And even our Sabbath lessons have been, you know, that required a lot of research. The last Sabbath lesson was like three hours long. So we're going to try to run through this as quickly as possible because I need to eat dinner. All right, let's jump in. All right, so this is the synopsis or the objective of what we're about to cover. Um, for, forgive me if there's a couple typos or a couple grammar mistakes. Like I said, I've been on a research binger and um, I got compiled the information for this and I put this lesson together uh, pretty quick, like a 24 hour turnaround. So um, I'll try to read over if there's any grammar or typos. Contrary to popular historical assumptions, the Phoenician alphabet was actually created by the Israelites. While the Hebrew language developed primarily out of the Canaanite language with other minor influences from Egypt and Mesopotamia, the writing system, on the other hand, was vice versa. There should be it should be other hand there. Other hand was vice versa. Proto Sinaitic script was developed by Hebrew slash Israelites during Middle Kingdom Egypt. The script evolved out of the Hebrews coming in contact with Egyptian hieroglyphics and blending the cuneiform from Assyria they would have already been accustomed to. Because remember, Abraham came out of Ur of the Chaldees and in Assyria and in Mesopotamia, they were using cuneiform. In Egypt, they were using hieroglyphics. So when the Hebrews came into contact with the Egyptians, which we're going to read in the Bible and sub two that the patriarchs did, they, it would have been a blending of the two, the Egyptian hieroglyphics with the cuneiform that they were would have already been accustomed to in, in uh, Mesopotamia. All right, so where are we at here? Uh, this was the first alphabet to be created. Evidence shows that during the time of, and that's true, it's just, it's, this is called the first alphabet, but the Canaanites get credit for it. But I'm going to show you like with biblical evidence and historical evidence with the timelines for when this was happening, when um, this proto sinaitic script was being written, that it was probably Hebrews who came up with it, not the Canaanites, okay? But the Canaanites did um, de further develop it, and they're the ones who spread it, because our modern-day alphabet is just an offshoot of that. So if you think about it, Africans created the first alphabet, created, spread the first alphabet. Black Hebrews or black Semitic peoples are the ones who probably created it in the first place, just showing you the contributions that um, so-called black people have made in history throughout, throughout time. There would be no alphabet so let's put this into perspective. So I wish there were more African um, nations and African groups who had writing systems so we could keep better records because oral tradition is not the best way to go about that. But if you think about it, and a lot of this stuff is because the Bible said that there were the Israelites would fall under a curse. This is not a, a Bible lesson, but the Bible does say that the Israelites will fall under a curse and we're under that now. Um, I've covered in some lessons before the Bible deals with Africa as well extensively. And there were certain things that were predicted that was going to happen to the that was prophesied that was going to happen to the Canaanites, the Egyptians, the Assyrians, all of these different people. And so these a lot of these people migrated into other parts of Africa as well, just like the Israelites did. And so they're still living under those prophecies and things that were prophesied over them as well. So we've lost a lot of our ancient culture. The Israelites have as well as the Hamitic Af uh, African groups as well have lost a lot of their uh, their ancient culture and lost a lot of the knowledge of it. And when I say ancient culture, like, for example, I mean, before you got to like, if you're Edo in Nigeria, before y'all got to Nigeria, if you're the Igbo, before you got to Nigeria, the Akan, before you got there in Kenya, you have Nihilitic groups like the Kalenjians. What were you before you got to Kenya when you were in Egypt, like stuff you were doing that y'all in Sudan, like were Kush, like how did y'all develop things there? You are the people who come who came from these ancient societies and you've lost knowledge of all of the things that you've accomplished. OK, so the point I'm making here is like we actually inv we invented writing. So even though we don't have the alphabet now, like in, you know, the rest of the world is, has more writing than the Europeans are the ones documenting everything. If it wasn't for us creating the alphabet, there wouldn't be anything for them to, to be writing anyway. That's just learning on your way to learning. Now. The uh, evidence shows that during the time of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, 
Proto-Israelites left inscriptions in Upper Egypt and the Sinai Peninsula. From in Upper and uh, Upper Egypt is just Southern Egypt. Okay, from this route, and we should all know where the Sinai Peninsula is. If you don't know where anything is, it's 2019. We have Google, and there's Google Maps. Just Google it. Okay. All right. But the Sinai Peninsula is a part of Egypt, and it's um, a little peninsula that's between. Um, Egypt and the Arabian Peninsula and Egypt and like Israel and Palestine. Okay. From, from this route, they have, they have had the greatest impact on writing systems in Africa. From this developed Hebrew writing, Phoenician and Southern Arabian, the spread continued to establish the Libyan writing systems of North Africa, Gies and East Africa, and other writing systems that developed from migrations of Israelites slash Canaanites. And I have in parentheses there, Bantu slash Niger Congo, okay, because you have Bantu languages, but they're all part of that in the Niger Congo family, and then you have Ni and then you have West African languages, okay. So you have Bantu and West African, so that's why I put Bantu and Niger Congo into West, Central, East, and Southern Africa. For example, the G the Gi Kandi of the Kikuyu or the Nisi Bidi of the Ikoi Ifik Igbo peoples, okay. And remember, we've done lessons on here on the YouTube, like on, on the, that are uploaded here on our YouTube page, where we've even covered um, the origins of the Afik. One of the lessons was like the Hebraic Phoenician origins, excuse me, of the Afik people. And we covered, we covered this stuff. All right. So let's keep pushing. All right. And buckle up because it's like you're going to be in class. We're going to go. We have to cover some um, basics first. So we're, first, we're going to cover cuneiform. Cuneiform or Sumerian cuneiform and Sumerian, Akkadian, Assyrian, Mesopotamian, pretty much all the same thing. Cuneiform or Sumerian cuneiform, one of the earliest systems of writing, was invented by the Sumerians. It is distinguished by its wedge-shaped marks on clay tablets. And the Sumerians were a black people as well. Nimrod, who was a Kushite, founded all of that stuff there in Mesopotamia anyway. And even the word, I think it's, yeah, Sumeria is the one where even the word means like black-headed people. All right. It is distinguished by its wedge shaped marks on clay tablets made by means of a blunt reed for a stylus. The name cuneiform itself simply means wedge shaped. Emerging in Sumer in the late fourth millennium BC, the Uruk fourth period, to convey the Sumerian language, which was a language isolate. Cuneiform writing began as a system of pictograms stemming from an earlier system of shaped tokens used for accounting. In the third millennium, the pictorial representations became simplified and more abstract as the number of characters in use grew smaller. Hittite cuneiform. Because remember, the Hittites ended up taking over and ruling Assyria or Mesopotamia for a little while. This was during the Amorite period. Like after when the first it was the Amorites who took control of Assyria. And we've covered this in our lesson dealing with the Hyksos. And we covered it in our Sabbath lesson, the invasion of the Hebrews. But the Amorites um, took over Assyria and Mesopotamia for a little while. I think it was like circa 2000 BC. And then after them, the Hittites ruled. But when, uh, when the Assyrians and other groups had started and the Elamites had started to push the Amorites out of Mesop Mesopotamia and stop them from ruling, they switched their focus and started ruling in Egypt. Okay. And they were the ones who... Uh, became the Hyksos. You can go see the lessons that deal, that uh, covers that and deals with that. All right. And that's why they, that's why even in Egypt, they were called the ruler, like rulers of foreign lands because they were ruling in Assyria. Then they came over and started ruling in Egypt. And that's why in the Bible, it even tells you that it was the Assyrian who afflicted um, the Israelites in Egypt. That's who the Pharaoh was that knew not Joseph. It was during the Hyksos period. Anyways, check those lessons out. Um, the Sabbath lesson, Invasion of the Hebrews, and the other lesson uh, on the Hyksos. And that'll give you all the information you need about that. All right, so where are we at here? Uh, Hittite cuneiform. The system consists of a combination of logo, phonetic, cons consonantal, alphabetic, and syllabic signs. The original Sumerian script was adapted for the writing of the Semitic Akkadian, Assyrian, Babylonian. And remember, I've told you they call it Semitic, but the Bible tells us Nimrod founded all of that. And when Gentiles are writing the history, 
they call these Semitic languages when really it's vice versa. They the the Hamitic languages had more influence on the Semitic languages in the beginning than the Semitic languages did on on the Hamitic languages. So really, these are Hamitic languages, Akkadian and Assyrian, because we're going to read that later in Genesis 10. Nimrod founded a cot. But anyways. Evelite and Amorite languages. OK, so the language and the language isolates Elamite, Hattic, Hurarian, excuse me, and Euro Uritan. And notice there, even the Amorites were using cuneiform, as well as Indo-European languages, Hittite and Luan. Same thing there. The Hittite language can't be an Indo-European language because the Hittites weren't Gentiles. The, Hittite, the Hittites descend from Canaan, according to the Bible. OK, but I'm using, you know, I use Western sources, academic sources. So I just put you put it out there how they say it. The Bible tells us, you know, otherwise. It inspired the later Semitic uh, Ugaritic alphabet, as well as old Persian cuneiform. Cuneiform writing was gradually replaced by the Phoenician alphabet during the Neo-Assyrian period. By the second century AD, the script had become extinct, its last traces being found in Assyria and Babylonia, and all knowledge of how to read it was lost until it began to be deciphered in the 19th century. All right, and the reason why we have to cover cuneiform is because this is the form of writing that Abraham would have been familiar with. Okay, the patriarch, the patriarch of the Israelites, the patriarch of the Ishmaelites and branches of the Arabs, the patriarch of um, the Edomites. This was hit. This would have been the form of writing he would have been familiar with coming out of Ur of the Chaldees. All right, so let's go over some precepts that collaborate with some of the stuff that I was just saying. I have some images to the side of the slide, on the side of the slide, showing you what cuneiform looked like. So this is from Genesis 10, verses 8 through 12. And Cush begat Nimrad. He began to be a mighty one on, in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. And according to tradition, I'll just, the Bible doesn't say this, but according to legend and tradition, Nimrod was a hunter of men. That's what the tradition says. The Bible doesn't say that, but legends say that he was hunting men. All right. Meaning killing like he was hunting human beings to kill. Wherefore, it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kelna in the land of Shinar. Verse 11. Out of that land went forth Asher and built it Nineveh and Calah, the same as a great city. So all these cities of ancient, Meso of ancient Mesopotamia, Nimrod founded. We even in the last one was talking about Akkadia or the Akkadians. You see here Nimrod, according to the Bible, founded all of these. Nimrod was a Cushite. All right. Genesis 11 and 28. And Haran died before his father, Terah, in the land of his nativity in Ur of the Chaldees. So here, Ter remember, Terah is the father of Abraham. And it's letting you know, and Haran was one of... Um, um, Abraham's brothers and Haran died in the land of the Ur of the Chaldees, which was his nativity. So this lets you know that Terah and Abraham's ancestors were living in Ur of the Chaldees before God called them out to move and to migrate. All right now. And like I said, you really want to check out that lesson I did on uh, on Sabbath, like a couple months ago, entitled Invasion of the Hebrews deals with a lot of historical con concepts and biblical history and things in the Bible that deal, even dealing with this. All right, so Genesis 11 and 31. And Terah took Abraham, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came on to Haran and dwelt there. So in the process of them leaving Ur of the Chaldees, they went to Haran, which Haran is somewhere near the border, like near the border of Turkey and Syria. All right. And that's where they were first. And then Terah ends up staying there and Abraham leaves and goes into the land of Canaan. If you go, if you're going to go and read further. OK, but the point we're establishing here is you see that Abraham was living in Ur of the Chaldees. Ur was like a Sumerian city, a Mesopotamian city he would have been experienced with cuneiform. That would have been the form of writing that Abraham would have been used to initially. All right. Okay, so now we're going to deal with Egyptian hieroglyphics. And once again, I have another image to the side, and I will discuss that in a second. But um, 
dealing with the um now I gotta remember which ones those are. Yeah, okay. All right, that's perfect. All right, so reason why we're now going to Egyptian hieroglyphics is because when Abraham came out of Ur of the Chaldees and went into the land of Canaan, he had to migrate into Egypt and further south into other parts of Africa. And we're going to show you that in the Bible. Like he, because if you go south from Egypt, where else can you go but into Africa? All right. So anyway, and remember the Cushites, and when I'm saying Cushites, we're not talking about the Abyssinians are where modern day Ethiopia is. We're talking about in Moro, which was uh, in Sudan. He Abraham probably went down there, too, as well. And that part of uh, they had their own script or they had their own uh, form of writing as well. All right. Now, so this is why we're going to cover Egyptian hieroglyphics, because Abraham went from having cuneiform as the primary means of writing to being around the Egyptians where their primary form of writing is hieroglyphics. So Egyptian hieroglyphics, hieroglyphs were the formal writing system used in ancient Egypt. Hieroglyphs com combine logographics, syllabic, and alphabetic elements with a total of some 1,000 distinct characters. Cursive hieroglyphs were used for religious literature on papyrus and wood. The later hieratic and demotic Egyptian scripts were derived from hieroglyphic writing, as was the proto cyanitic script that later evolved into the Phoenician alphabet. So the based out of the the Egyptian hieroglyphs is where the Hebrews learned the proto what we're calling and we're go and scholars and you know archaeologists, anthropologists, linguistic linguistic uh, researchers called a proto cyanitic uh, script. Okay. So remember, Abraham would have initially been accustomed to cuneiform. Now he's around the Egyptians and they do hieroglyphs. And so out of him coming into contact with them and hieroglyphics, then we get the proto cyanitic script developed. OK, that later evolved into the Phoenician alphabet through the Phoenicians, through the Phoenician alphabet's major child systems, the Greek and Aramaic scripts. The Egyptian hieroglyphic script is ancestral to the majority of scripts in modern use. Most prominently, the Latin and Skrillic scripts through Greek and the Arabic script and Brahmic family of scripts through Aramaic. And there's, this is, they're saying this because the Hebrews developed the alphabet out of a combination of the hieroglyphics and the cuneiform. OK, but primarily out of the hieroglyphics. So that means that was the root. So black Egyptians were the ones who have contributed to pretty much the, the scripts that we all use today. And then the Hebrews took it and developed the alphabet. OK, so it was like a tag team. You got Ham and you got Shem. You got the you got the Hebrews and you got the Hamitic people were the ones who gave you. The writing systems that you have today and you're welcome. All right. And I want to bring out this other point, too, because the hate stuff is stupid between groups, even for the Israelites. Remember, our ancestors married the Canaanites numerous, numerous times. Our ancestors married the. I'm going to put it like this. The, the matriarch of the tribe of Judah was Tamar. She's the one. She's the mother of the tribe of Judah, like of, of the children that Judah had. She was a Canaanite. That, that's the southern kingdom's number one tribe. That's the line Jesus came out of. OK. And not to mention, the Bible tells you repeatedly throughout throughout the entire Old Testament that the Israelites were constantly marrying these people. And it wasn't just men marrying their women. It was we. Our women married their men and our men married their women, just like in Africa today, even in West Africa, Central Africa, Southern Africa, even though you may have East Africa, even though you may have all these tribal divisions and people who don't like each other, but they still end up marrying each other. That's a common thing. We've been doing that for thousands of years since for we've been doing that for 4000 years. OK. All right. Uh, this is just learning on your learning on your way to. Uh, learning okay but then even remember with the northern kingdom who's the number one tribe that you think of when you think of the northern kingdom ephraim that's even one of the names for the northern kingdom who was the matriarch for the uh what nationality was the matriarch for the northern kingdom she was egyptian because remember pharaoh gave joseph his wife all right so all of this beef and stuff like between groups like like i like to say have a coke and a smile nobody's over here trying to do anything like there's no hate here. We just bring out information. All right. This picture on the side, though, if you look at it, 
you have cuneiform on the top you in the middle you have um hieroglyphics and at the bottom you have ancient china uh, ancient chinese writing okay so you see some similarities between the three but you also see a lot of similarities between the Ch ancient chinese and the egyptian this is why we have brothers who say like there's brothers who say that the Asians are like the Chinese people and Japanese, Korean, Southeast Asians, you know, Cambodians, Vietnamese, that they're Japheth. They're not. They're not Japheth. They're not Gentiles. Their languages don't even match up with uh, their languages. Their languages are more similar to uh, our languages. I'll give you an example. Like there's a place out here in California called Waba Grill. It's a Korean place. In Korean, it means Waba means come here. In Swahili, the word for come here is Kuja Haba. Kuja Haba. In Korean, the word for come here is Waba. All right. These are similarities. Look at the look at the similarities between the Chinese writing and the Egyptian hieroglyphics. OK. And like I said, I live in California. I see Chinese, Korean, Japanese writing all the time, or like on different businesses and different things. And it don't look it looks like the ancient like Canaanite uh, writings. All right. So just another learning on your way to learning. And just so we're clear, the evidence supports this. There's Bible, there's Bible verses that support this. There's history that supports this. The East Asians descend from Hittites and Sinites, which were both Canaanite groups. OK, the ones who descend from the Hittites are the more so the ones who went across the steppe because that's where the hit that's where the Hittites were. They were originally in Turkey. And when they went into East Asia, they continued across the steppe, okay, and the plateaus. And then you have Sinites who went into uh, East Asia as well. All right, but that's just learning on your way to learning. Okay, so now let's uh, explore this proto cyanitic script. And this is basically the alphabet or the writing system that the Hebrews developed out of a combination of the cuneiform from when they left Ur of the Chaldees and coming in contact with the um, Egyptians and the hiero and hi Egyptian hieroglyphics. And well, we'll cover that when we get to the precepts. But remember, when Abraham was traveling, he wasn't by himself. He was with his nephew, Lot. And Lot had lots of servants and slaves and uh, just like Abraham did. They had a, it wasn't just Abraham and Sarah and a couple people. You're talking about hundreds of people, if not thousands. All right. That's something to remember. This is a group. This is a group of people, all right, a large group of people migrating as nomads throughout Egypt, other parts of Africa, and um, parts of the Middle East are what we colloquially like to call Northeast Africa. All right, Proto-Sinitic, also referred to as Sinitic and Proto-Canaanite when found in Canaan, is a term for both a Middle Bronze, and let me put this point out there because I just remembered it. The reason, another reason, because I don't know if I have this in the notes. But another reason why we know that the Hebrews were the ones who probably invented this first, not the Canaanites, is you don't find any of the proto, you don't find hardly any proto cyanitic script anywhere in the land of Canaan. It was founded first. The earliest ones were founded in Egypt, like in southern Egypt, as you're getting closer to the modern day country of Sudan and in the Sinai Peninsula. All right. Anyways, is a term for both a Middle Bronze Age Middle Kingdom script and Middle Kingdom meaning the Egyptian Middle Kingdom. All right. So the in the Middle Kingdom is the period of Egypt right before the Hyksos or the foreigners take over. All right. And remember the Hyksos were Amorites. All right. The Hebrews were already in dealing with Egypt before the Hyksos even came into play. Excuse me. All right. Script attested in uh, in a small corpus of inscriptions found at Sarabat el Kadim. Excuse me, in the Sinai Peninsula, Egypt, and the reconstructed common ancestor of the Paleo Hebrew, Phoenician, South Arabian scripts. And by South Arabian, we're talking about like the Sabians and stuff, right? Moabite script, Aramaic alphabet, and Edomite script. So the Moabite form of writing developed out of this. and But that shouldn't be surprising because the Moabites are a Hebraic group too. Remember, the Moabites would have been with would have been around Abraham. Moab was one of Lot's sons. Lot was Abraham's nephew. So that would mean 
for Moab, Abraham would be his great uncle. OK, Aramaic alphabet, the Aramaic alphabet that was used by the Arameans. OK, and the Arameans are also called Aram, Damascus, but they were the ones living in Syria, not us, Syria, but the nation of Syria. You have us, Syria with an A at the beginning and two S's, and then you have Syria with no A, just S-Y-R-I-A. And Edomite script. Once again, too, the Edomites were related to the Israelites because Esau was Jacob's brother. All right. So all of this stuff naturally follows that it should make that it should make sense. All right. And by extension of most historical and modern alphabets, the earliest proto Sinaitic inscriptions are mostly dated between the mid 19th um, and that's early date and mid 16th late date century. So basically from the 1800s to the 1500s. The principal debate between an early date around 1850 and a late date around 1550 BC. All right. The choice of one or the choice of one or the other date decides whether it is proto sinaitic or proto canaanite and by extension locates the invention of the alphabet in Egypt or Canaan respectively. All right. We're from the school of thought we're coming from and the research shows 1850. We don't uh, subscribe to the 1550 BC date we go with the 1850 bc date as the um uh, around that time as a starting point of when this start the proto sinaitic script started to be developed by the hebrews okay and that would have been at the same time that uh abraham would have still been alive okay uh jacob at this would have been a time when jacob would have been alive as well too all right or not uh, isaac okay anyways uh we'll keep going i'm getting off i'm getting off but this is the time. This was during the time of the patriarchs. OK, the choice of one of the other dates um, decides whether it is proto Sinaitic or proto Canaanite and by extension locates the invention of the alphabet in Egypt or Canaan, respectively. However, the discovery of the Wadi El Hole inscriptions near the Nile River. And this is why I said we go with the 1850 Nile River shows that the script originated in Egypt. The evolution of proto sinaitic and the various Proto-Canaanite scripts during the Bronze Age is based on rather scant epigraphic evidence. It is only with the Bronze Age collapse and the rise of new Semitic kingdoms in the Levant that Proto-Canaanite is clearly attested. And that's from the um, Byblos inscriptions from the 10th to 8th century BC. And Byblos, that was just a city on the coast of uh, the Mediterranean off of uh modern day Lebanon right now. But it was a Phoenician city by the, uh, that the Canaanites had, one of their um, most successful cities. And Kerbat Kuifa inscription circa 10th century BC. Now, if you look over here to the side, I know the print's kind of small, but this picture is actually from um, Wadi al ha in Egypt. And this is the proto sanetic script. And we don't know, as I show you in scriptures, I, we don't know. Maybe Abraham left this. We don't know. All right. And I'm going to show you in scripture, though, how that is a possibility. And you can read this on your own time, but it gives what the best they can to try to translate what it says. OK. All right. And so this is the source we're going to be reading from next. You can see where we're reading it from, where we got it from UCLA Encyclopedia of Egyptology. Um, like I said before, I work. I'm a librarian by trade. I work at a university. Um, I'm able to go to school for free, so I'm thinking about getting a second master's degree in history and maybe just being like a professor at a community college or whatever. But I have a lot of access to resources because, like I said, I work at a university. So it always baffles me when people are trying to challenge my research. All right. And no, I don't work at UCLA. Like, I'm not I'm not that smart. All right. <laughs> Early, the UCs are like the equivalent of like. Ivy League schools out here on the West Coast, like pub for public schools. Anyways, early alphabetic inscriptions, some of the UCs. Early alphabetic inscriptions, also present in the Wadi El Hol, are two short early alphabetic inscriptions. And mind you, Wadi El Hol is a location near the Nile in southern Egypt, right? Um, and then it lists the figure as 2000, Darnell, 2003, Darnell, blah, 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 because he's one of the ones who actually documented this. Blah, blah, blah. Speculative, I'm skipping down. Speculative translation attempts in Wimmer and Wimmer Dweckett, 2001, Aster, 2002, P 
popular accounts in man. And now we're about to move on to the next uh, page. I have to start here um, because this the section I wanted actually started here on a on another page at the bottom of a page. But the main point I want to get to is on the next page. Okay. And most of this is just quoting where they got the sources from. And I don't have um, you'll see some of the figures on the next slide. All right, let's dive on in. So that up there at the top left, that's a tracing of the proto um that was found at Wadi El Hole. Oh, and remember, when they found this stuff, they found these uh, Hebraic writings amongst hundreds of hieroglyphics and hieratic and demotic and even Coptic um, Egypt, Egyptian writings here and even in the location in Sinai because the Egyptians were there constantly writing stuff and they controlled the area and they wrote stuff even over over thousands of years when their um, writing systems had changed. So these were just like a couple things that were found written in this script amongst that. So that's how we know, too, this wasn't written by Egyptians. This was written by actual Hebrews who were there. OK. All right. Because these are the only these are anomalies that were found amongst a bunch of all the Egyptian hieroglyphs and, and things of that nature. All right. I'm not reading the names of the of people where they got information from, which are paleographically more archaic than previously discovered. proto cyanitic inscriptions, proto cyanitic inscriptions, unlike the roughly drawn and hieroglyphicizing signs of the sign of the Sinai inscriptions, the Wadi El Hol text reveal a derivation from lapidary heretic. That I'm not reading. That's Darnell again. These people like quoting their name, where they got all this stuff from. But that's UCLA in the Egyptologist. Heriatic, a hybrid heriatic and hieroglyphic script attested already during the Old Kingdom. All right. Ideally suited to carving rock inscriptions, the lapidary cursive enjoyed a florid. I can't see that word because it's writing small. Florid and middle king. I guess that's florid and Middle Kingdom rock inscriptions. Man, I wish they would stop putting the names of the people they're getting the information from. It's like we know we trust you. We believe you that your your information is sound. Like you work at UCLA, your professors there in the Department of Egyptology. We, we trust you. You don't have to prove the point so hard. All right. And because it's like it's breaking up the reading of it and freestanding monuments in both Egypt and Nubia. Non-Egyptians occasionally accompanied Middle Kingdom Egyptian missions and Western Asiatics appear as armed auxiliaries with Egyptian mining expeditions in Sinai. In Sinai, Western Asiatics would be Hebrews. This would be different Hebraic groups and Canaanites. OK, but in this case, when we're dealing with the proto sinaitic we're dealing with Hebrews. And this shouldn't be a foreign concept to you. Abraham defeated pretty much all of the world powers. I think it was in Genesis 14 when. Um, when he had to take on title king of nations and the king of Elam and all this stuff, when they had captured Lot, when they had captured Lot. All right. So if Abraham was in Egypt, it's not that uh, it shouldn't be that hard to believe that maybe the Hebrews, when they were in Egypt, might have assisted the Egyptians on a military expedition. Abraham did. You can read Abraham doing military exploits in the Old Testament of the Bible. You can also read where Jacob, when he was blessing his children, he gave an extra portion to Joseph's children, and he said, I took it from the Amorite by, by the sword. So Jacob took it from the Amorite by the sword, meaning he had to go to war with them, and that's how he got that extra portion. All right. To take this full circle, when Abraham first left Ur of the Chaldees and got into the land of Canaan, when he was dwelling in the plain of Mamre, he was in confederation with the Amorites. OK, and at that time, that was at the beginning of the time when the Amorites were ruling, starting to rule in Assyria. OK, but by the time we get to Jacob, something must have happened between them because Jacob wasn't uh, Jacob took went to war against the Amorites. And that's how he ended up getting a double portion. You can read that in Genesis chapter 49. This is why I love the Bible and I love history, because the stuff it just all of the stuff goes hand in hand. That may have played a contributing factor into why once when the Hyksos took over in Egypt, why they afflicted the Israelites. You know, we don't know, because remember, the Hyksos was the Hyksos kingdom was started by the Amorites. All right. All of this stuff is just learning on your way to learning. 
and things that we cover here and in, in a lot of the lessons that we do. All right, where are we at? Interaction of such Semitic speaking groups with Egyptian military slash expedition scribes led to the invention of an alphabetic script found in two inscriptions from the Wadi El Hull and the proto sinaitic inscriptions. Darnell, oh, we don't need to read that, blah, 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 where are we at? Employing, uh, employing signs derived from lapidary heretic Egyptian shapes and assigning to this limited number of signs arcophonic values based on the Semitic language names of the objects depicted, the melting pot of Egyptian expeditionary forces gave rise to the alphabet during the Middle Kingdom. Okay. Uh, let's see if there's anything else we need to read with this paragraph. Uh, let's see. No. I mean, if you want to read the rest of that, you can, but I guess we get the, I guess we get the point. Um, looking, no, we get the point. So the proto sinaitic writing script was formed from Hebrew contacts of coming in, coming in contact with the Egyptians and doing military expeditions and different things with the um, ancient Egyptians. Okay, that's basically what this is saying. All right, I'm just going to leave this up for about a minute. You can pause the video if you want to look at it, examine it. I know the writing is small. You might have to put it on your TV or blow it up. Um, but here it's just showing you the hieroglyphics. It's a chart showing you the hieroglyphics, the proto sinaitic and then showing you what the things look like in Phoenician and different uh, Paleo-Hebrew and the different um, symbols. And this is actually where we got our, our alphabet from today, the letters and the different things, we the different... Uh, the letters that we use in our alphabet, like A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Okay, but anyways, you can you can look this chart over and uh, you know compare and see how similar the symbols are. All right, you have Hebrew, Aramaic, Aramean, uh, Paleo Hebrew, all of that there. All right, so next slide: Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's writing system. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's writing system. The Bible and history refer to and refer to our Sabbath lesson, the invasion of the Hebrews, for more clarification on this and our history lesson on the Hyksos. But the Bible and history documents how many of the Semitic speakers during Middle Kingdom Egypt were in fact Hebraic and are proto-Israelites. Massive disruption, and I have their famine slash war slash immigration. And like I said, go cover that that lesson I did invasion of the hebrews because when abraham came out of ur of the chaldees and went into canaan in the middle east his descendants started disrupting stuff and supplanting people to eat everywhere that the where the edomites went the moabites the ammonites the midianites um the ishmaelites who are a branch of arabs and even the israelites everywhere that they went and occupied there was already people living there hamitic people specifically living there that they supplanted this caused a lot of disruption and cause a lot of people to migrate and immigrate. Okay, there was also famines going on, wars, and the and the Bible doc actually documents this. In the Lev in the Levant caused wide scale migration of peoples into Egypt. These were Canaanites and Hebraic groups. More than likely, the inscription left in southern Egypt was probably during the times of Abraham. Let's go and read. If you have a Bible, turn to Genesis chapter twelve, and we're going to pick it up at verse one. And let's read the greatest history book of all time, the Bible. Do, 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 do. Oh yeah, but I'll probably get some. I'll probably get some uh, Hamites or some Old Testament Hebrews. That's the white man's book, the Bible. I still get the, those ridiculous comments. I'm just like, how ridiculous can you be? Genesis 12. And let's look at verse let's look at verse one and we're going to read the, pretty much the whole chapter up to the next chapter verse seven. Now, the Lord has said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing and I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And the way that all families of the earth are going to be blessed through Abraham is through his seed, because Christ came through his seed. And that's the only way, that's the only means by which man can be saved. So Abraham departed as the Lord has spoken unto him. 
and Lot went and Lot went with him. And Abram was 70 and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And remember, Haran was at near where the border of Turkey and Syria. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan and into the land of Canaan. They came. And when it says the souls that they had got in Haran, meaning he had picked up more servants and amassed more wealth. And Abram passed through the land onto the place of Shechem, onto the plain of Morai, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land, and there builded he an altar unto the Lord, who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and high on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord, and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed going on still toward the south. 10. And there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn, to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. So now Abram, Abram, a lot, all of their family is going to go into Egypt. This would have been a large group of Hebrews because you have Lot, you have Abraham and all of their servants and all of their uh, everybody, wives, children servants and remember abraham took like three well we're gonna read that i'm gonna call it audible abraham took like i think it was like 300 men and went to war um against the world powers at that time but we'll read it all right verse 12 and this is what this is all of the people who went down into egypt all right and it came verse 11 and it came to pass when he was come near to enter into egypt that he said unto sarai his wife behold now I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore, it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. And that wasn't necessarily a, a lie because Sarai was his, or Sarah was his half sister. All right, 14. And it came to pass that when Abram was coming to Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very fair. The princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And he entreated Abram well for her sake. And he had sheep and oxen and, and he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. All right. And this is all that Abraham had when he was in Egypt, all like massive wealth and lots of servants. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Why, did it, why saidest thou she is my sister? So I might have taken her to me to wife. Now therefore, behold, thy wife, take her and go thy way. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. And this is before Isaac has been born yet, okay? So this is early on in the time of, of the patriarchs. This might be like circa 1900 BC. All right. Now notice this. Now we're in chapter 13, verse 1. And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had and lot with him into the south. Now, we all can read. I don't care what you're going to look up or what somebody says, their opinion. We all can read the Bible and we can think for ourselves. If Abraham was in Egypt, right? And Abra and now it says Abraham went south. What's south of Egypt? It's not Saudi Arabia. It's not the Arabian Peninsula. It's not, no, because he was in Egypt. What happens when you go south of Egypt? What's the next, let's think of in today's terms. What's the next country? Sudan. And what, if you keep going south, what comes after that? South Sudan. What comes after that? Like Eritrea, Ethiopia, uh, Djibouti, Somalia, Kenya. All right. So where did Abraham go after he left out of Egypt? He went further into Africa for a little while. Okay. Like this is we're reading Two, And Abram was very rich. And so mind you, and remember where Wadi El Hol was, where they found the proto-Sinitic inscription or the Hebrew, the first Hebraic um, alphabet system and Hebraic writing system that eventually turned into the, the Phoenician alphabet and all of this stuff, other, other writing systems, uh, that was in southern Egypt, okay? That's why I said maybe Abraham left that, or maybe one of Abraham's men's servants left that, 
because uh, it sounds the, the way some of the translations for it, it sounds like something a servant would say. But anyways, peep 13 and Abram went 13, chapter 13 and verse one. And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife. And all that he had and lot with him into the south. And Ab so like we said, south of Egypt is what? Sub-Saharan Africa. This is not rocket science. So yes, Abraham was in around circa 2000 BC, circa 1900 BC. The Hebrews were already going into Sub-Saharan Africa. All right, we've always been doing that. Two, and Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver and in gold. And for the Edo, I'm pointing, this is your ancestor too. I don't know what why you have a problem with being with being uh, descendants of Edom or being descendants of Esau, that's your that's where y'all came from. Just like you know, you have Israelites in Nigeria and stuff too. We're all related. Like I'm covering. This is your ancestor too, Abraham. All right, and he's in sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, verse three. And he went on his journeys from the south, even to Bethel, onto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and High. So after he spent some after Abraham spent some time in sub-Saharan Africa or more southern parts of Egypt, maybe modern day Sudan, he went back to Bethel. All right. And went up out of Egypt and went back into the Middle East. Now, verse four, onto the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord and Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together for their substance was great so that they could not dwell together. So they had so many cats, so much cattle, so many servants that they couldn't even dwell with. Each, they couldn't even dwell with each other together. That's how large of a group went down into Egypt with Abraham. That's how large of a group went down and was chilling in sub-Saharan Africa for who knows how long that we were just reading about. A large group of Hebrews. OK, verse seven. And there was and there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. I'm going to call a quick audible. Let's look at Genesis chapter 14 really quick. All right. Uh, where is this? Do, do, do. I want to read one thing, one little part. All right. I'm going to Genesis 14. I'm going to start at verse 11 for the sake of time. Well, let's start at verse one. Then I'll skip up. And it came to pass in the days of Amraphiel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elisar, Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, that these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah. These are Canaanite states. Shinab, king of Adma, and Shembar, king of Zeboam, and, and the king of Bela, which is Zor. All these were joined together in the valley of Siddim, which is, which is the salt sea. Twelve years they served Chedorlaomer, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. All right, now let's, I'm going to skip to verse 11. Uh, and they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals and went their way. And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom. Because if we would have kept reading in chapter 13, Lot and Abraham separated, and Lot decided to go settle in Sodom and Gomorrah. All right. And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. And there came one that had escaped and told Abram, the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol, the brother of Anar. And these were confederate with Abram. Remember, I was telling you the Hebrews were in, at first were in confederation with the Amorites. 14. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, his nephew, he armed his trained servants born in his own house. 318 and pursued them on to Dan. All right, I'm going to stop there. So he ended up getting a lot and he ended up defeating these people. But he got 318 armed servants. OK, and we don't know how many servants even lot would have had. All right. Just learning on your way to learning, but showing you that it was large groups of Hebrews that went down into Egypt with Abraham and went into sub-Saharan Africa. It was and and they were militarized. OK, that's why we read from the sources. That is said the proto cyanitic script was developed by Western Asiatics who were who would help the Egyptians on military expeditions and different excursions. OK. All right. Let's keep reading here now from this slide. It was part of God's master plan to have the first alphabet come through the Hebrews 
so that mankind is without excuse for not knowing who Yah is. And that's true. If they, the first alphabet that we use came through from the Hebrews, there's no excuse for people not knowing who God is, right? The inscription found in the Sinai Peninsula was made sometime during the period from when Jacob and the Israelites were given land allotments in Goshen, which is the fertile valley east of the Nile stretching to Sinai, to the Exodus. All right. So let's, let me read that again because I read the in parentheses part. Um, the inscription found in the Sinai Peninsula was made sometime during the period from when Jacob and the Israelites were given land allotments in Goshen uh, to the Exodus being made either by Israelite pastoralists, um, Hebrew mining slaves, or during the Exodus. So let's look at some um, precepts for this. So the ones that, the inscriptions that they found in Sinai could have been done either when the, uh, when the Hebrews were pastoralists in, um, and we're going to read in the Bible when the Egyptians allowed them to come there and stay in the time of Joseph, okay, when Joseph was second in command in Egypt and they got placed in Goshen, it could have been written during that time. It also could have been written during um, it also could have been written when there were Hebrew mining slaves because there were they had turquoise mines and other mines over there, copper mines, different things like that. And they would use slaves. And this is during the time of the Hebrew. Uh, this would have been during the time when the Hebrews were enslaved in Egypt. And I know some people will say, well, you can't. They'll be like in the Bible. It only says that they were in Goshen. That's the one the main specific place that the the Israelites were at during slavery and when they came in there, but they were slaves like they're going to the Egyptians would have used them for all kinds of projects, not just things in Goshen. You know, don't you know, don't strain at a gnat. All right. And I'm just presenting all the different possibilities. It could have been one of these three, one of these three things, or it could have been done during the Exodus because the location in um, Sinai is along the path that they would have went by that area um, during the Exodus. So it could have also been left during then. I've heard theories even like, oh, well, I'm not going to get into that for the sake of time. Let's look at Genesis 45 verses 9 through 11. Genesis, let's try to get through this really quick. Genesis 45 verses 9 through 11. Genesis 45 verses 9 through 11. Haste ye and go up to my father and say unto him, Thus saith my son Joseph, God hath made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me, tarry not. And thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen, and thou shalt be near unto me, thou and thy children, and thy children's children, and thy flocks, and thy herds, and all that thou hast. And there will I nourish thee, for yet there are five years of famine, lest thou and thy household, and all that thou hast, come to poverty. All right, now let's go to Genesis 47. Genesis 47. I'm going to read 1 through 14. Then Joseph, then Joseph came and told Pharaoh and said, my father and my brethren and their flocks and their herds and all that they have are come up out of the land of Canaan. And behold, they are in the land of Goshen. And he took some of his brethren, even five men, and presented them unto Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto his brethren, what is your occupation? And they said unto Pharaoh, thy servants are shepherds, both we and also our fathers. They said moreover unto Pharaoh, for to sojourn in the land are we come. For thy servants have no pasture for their flocks, for the famine, for the famine is sore in the land of Canaan. Now, therefore, we pray thee, let thy servants dwell in the land of Goshen. And Pharaoh spake unto Joseph, saying, thy father and thy brethren are come unto thee. The land of Egypt is before thee. In the best of the land, make thy father and brethren to dwell. In the land of Goshen, let them dwell. And if thou knowest any men of activity among them, make them rulers over my cattle. And Joseph, and Joseph brought in Jacob, his father, and set him before Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto Jacob, How old art thou? And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are a hundred and thirty years. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been, and have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers and the days of their pilgrimage. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from before Pharaoh. And Joseph placed his father and his brethren and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt and the best of the land in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had commanded. And Joseph nourished his father and his brethren and all his father's household with bread according to their families. And there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very sore, so that the land of Egypt and all the land of Canaan fainted by reason of famine. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the corn which they 
for which they bought. And Joseph bought the money, brought the money into Pharaoh's house. The reason why I wanted to read these last two verses was to show you that there was famine going on. This is the beginnings of the Canaanites starting to migrate into Egypt as well. OK, and this is when you're going to end up getting the Hyksos and the Amorites starting to rule the Western Amorites which is why you get the word Amaru, which comes from the Amorites, which is where you get the word more, which is why you're probably and it's also probably another name for a root for America, because there's no America. There's no we have no records anywhere of America, of anything saying that America was named after America of its future. But since ancient times, Amaru or Amar has been known has been a word used to mean West and the Americas are west of the old world. That's just learning on your way to learning. Let's skip down to verse 27. And Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt in the country of Goshen, and they and they had possessions therein and grew and multiplied exceedingly. Now let's go over to Exodus chapter 8 really quick for one verse. Exodus chapter 8 and verse 22. And I will and I will sever in that day the land of Goshen in which my people dwell that no swarms Swarms of flies shall be there to the end. Thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. So even during the time of their um, when they were in captivity in Egypt, you still see that the largest concentration of Israelites were living in Goshen, right, which stretches towards the Sinai Peninsula. Let's look at Exodus 9 and 26 just to reiterate. All right. Only in the land of Goshen where the children of Israel were, was there no hell. This is during the plague. So Goshen was the only area. That didn't get plagued. All right, let's move on. All right, now let's deal with the spread into Africa of this writing system. The Hebraic writing system spread into North Africa, and you can find it in the Tifi Naga or Libic via Abraham's grandson through Midian, Ephor. And remember, we've covered that lots of times. The name of Africa, the continent of Africa, is not named after Scipio Africanus. That's a lie. Uh, and I understand, like, for people from camps and other churches, it's 2019. We have access to more information. There's stuff that y'all were saying in the 70s, 80s, 90s, even early 2000s before we had. Is it even says in the last days that knowledge would increase? Okay, and that's what's happening. So stop saying that Scipio that Africa was named after Scipio Africanus because it wasn't. Uh, we've covered that numerous times. All right. Uh, Scipio got the name Africanus for his exploits in Northwest Africa and dealing with the Carthaginians because there was already a people living there named that were called the Afrique, the Afir, the Ephar, and it comes from Ephir. Um, you can find this in the Jewish historian Josephus, who you know lived in um, in um, the early like the early church period, early Christian period. Uh, time of Jesus period around there. He documented that. All right. So anyways, point is, is so e and Ephor was settled in Northwest Africa um, by Abraham. That's what Joseph said. And according to traditions, OK, we're just going you have to you there's there's the Bible. And that's what we use for doctrine and getting salvation. And the Bible lines up with history. But then because these people actually existed and the Bible is real, there's other doc, like there's other cultures and groups who may have um, documents of things that happen with these people because they interacted with them. OK, so Ephor was play, we, and we've covered this, like I said, a lot. Ephor was placed in northwest Africa. He would have been and he was a descendant of Midian. So there would have he was the son of Midian. So it would have been a Midianite colony in northwest Africa. All right. Uh, that would have been the first time the Hebraic writing system would have got placed there. And the Phoenicians, because then later the Phoenicians came, because remember they established colonies like Carthage and different things. Uh, and the Phoenicians establishing Punic script in its colonies. The system spread into Eastern Africa via the ancient South Arabian script, because remember the South Arabian script came out of the proto cyanitic The ancient South Arabian script branched from the proto cyanitic script in about the 9th century BC. It was used for writing the old South Arabian languages of Sabiac, that's the Sabians, Quatambinic, um, that's from Jokatan, the earlier, uh, the, the Arabs that came before, it, before Ishmael. They were also descendants of Eber, because Eber had two sons, Peleg and Jokatan, and Jokatan, Abraham, 
comes through Abraham's lineage comes through Peleg. Okay, Jokatan went into Arabia and was the first Hebraic group to start displacing Arabs. I mean, not Arabs, displacing the Hamitic groups that were already living in Arab in the Arabian Peninsula. And those Hamitic groups were primarily Cushites or Cushitic, as the Bible tells us. Okay, um, it was used in the writing. It was used for writing the old South Arabian languages of Sabiac, Quetabinic, and remember, anybody who's a descendant of Eber is a Hebrew. That's where you get the root for the word Hebrew comes from Eber. Hadramutic, Maninian, Hasiatic, and Giz in Demat. All right, and the earliest inscriptions in the the earliest inscriptions in the script date to the 9th century BC in the northern Red Sea region, Eritrea. There are no letters for vowels which are marked by matri lexions. Its mature form was reached around 500 BC, and its use continued until the 6th century AD, including ancient North Arabian inscriptions and variants of the alphabet when it was, when it was displaced by the Arabic alphabet. In Ethiopia and Eritrea, it evolved later into the Giz script, which added symbols throughout the centuries, has been used to write Aramaic Tigrinya, and Tigri. If I'm butchering those, I'm from America. I live in the Western world. I don't know how to pronounce that stuff. Have a coconut smile and just be glad that somebody in America is trying to teach people over here about y'all's cultures and histories and stuff. Stop straining at a gnat. I, how am I going to know how to pronounce it if I've never lived in Ethiopia or these places? I, I, I'm not going to know how to pronounce it. All right. I can only know off of what I read. All right. As well as other languages, including various Semitic Cushitic and Nilo-Saharan languages. Remnants of the archaic form of this system can be found among some of the Israelite slash Canaanite slash Hebraic populations, parentheses there, Bantu slash Niger Congo, of West Africa and Southern Africa. Even the Vi script created in the in 19th century Liberia, this is a offshoot, you can look this up on your own time, was probably based off of the Cherokee script introduced by a free slave from Virginia of mixed Cherokee descent. I had to put that one in there. You can, we're, for the sake of time, we can't cover it. The dude's name, I think it was like, it was Augustine something. But if you want more information on that, hit me up, like either email us or leave a comment um, and I'll get you the information on that. But when I was read, I actually read the sources on that. There was a, a free slave in Liberia in the 1820s from Virginia and he was mixed with Cherokee. And uh, the Cherokee had developed the script in the early 1820s and there's records of this dude you know interacting with people and telling them about the script and then it's like is it coincidence that the Vi script looks eerily similar almost to a t as a cherokee script or did this israelite dude you know introduce it to them you know from america coming over to liberia and the Vi would be you know they're israelites too because they're mandy people and we've covered that um we've done lessons on how the mandy people are israelites all right Let's keep going. Uh, yeah. Okay, so here are some examples of sub-Saharan scripts, and there you can see some of the imagery over there to the side. But we're gonna you're gonna see some more imagery as we go forward. But you have in you have Adinkra, and that was developed by the Akan peoples. You have Bogo Lanfini. And that was developed by the Mande, specifically, primarily the Bambara. You have Sinda, which was also developed by the Mande, but that's a sand divination thing, like where they would try to do divination, tell the future, predict things, and they would make markings in the sand. Uh, Gikande, Gikandi, which is a Kikuyu, which was a Kikuyu form of writing or also record keeping. Huronko, which is a Mande, specifically Yalun Yalunka and Limba form of script. Congo cosmograms, and that's from the Bakongo. Um, the Nisi Bidi um, from the Igbo, which has been around for a long, long time. Um, Poro Mande, that's all the Poro, which comes from the Mande. And the Poro, that was a secret society um, that developed in West Africa. But the Poro that the Mande set up. But they also had their own symbols and things. And if you look at these symbols, like even look at the symbols to the side, they look like a combination of hieroglyphs and the script and uh, um, the proto uh script that we were looking at. The cuneiform 
the first the cuneiform, then the Egyptian hieroglyphics, then the proto -Sin then the proto Sinaitic script. Okay. Um, then you have vice uh, syllabary, which we already covered, might have been possibly Cher possibly uh, derived from the Cherokee script. And then you have Tukon, another example. And these are not all of them. I'm just covering some. The Tuko Nansana, which was found in Angola. All right. So just showing that we did have some forms of writing and symbols, even though it wasn't, even though once we got into West Africa and Southern Africa and East Africa, it didn't, we didn't keep it developed as much as we should. But obviously having these symbolic forms of writing still being used shows that at some point these Israelite groups who were living in West Africa, Central Africa and Southern Africa at one point did have writing systems. OK, as well as the other Hebraic groups um, who descend from the Edomites, the Moabites, the Ammonites um, and also the Canaanite groups who migrated into Africa as well. They would have had forms of writing that they lost at some point, but they still kept some knowledge of it. That's why we have these different, excuse me, symbolic scripts that lasted even into modern day times. All right. So in Dinkra, associated most often with a multitude of symbols, the term in Dinkra is more accurately used to denote a symbolic funerary message given to the trans transitioning and our departed souls. The term D means to make use of or to employ. And the term Enkra means message. Literally, then, Endinkra means to make use of a message. But when spoken together, the term is understood to mean to leave one another or to say goodbye. Moreover, because the term Ninkra has Kra, life force or soul, at its root, Endinkra is further understood as a message that a transitioning or, and or departed soul takes with it on its return to Naim. Naiman. Thus, because when you die, what happens? You, the breath of life leaves out of you and the air that you breathe re you returns back to God or goes back into the atmosphere. That's what ends up happening. All right. Let's, uh, and Naiman is the name for their, that the name that they use um, for the Most High. Okay. Thus, Andinkre is a type of language. Although it is clear that the Akan have used Andinkre for many centuries, there has been much academic debate over the exact origins of the symbols. The most commonly accepted legend comes from the stampers, those who create slash produce Indinkra. Legend has it that the symbols gained their name from Nana Kufi Indinkra, the famous 19th century king of Gaiman, located in neighboring Ivory Coast. King Indinkra was said to have challenged the authority of the then Ash Ashantahina Nana Ase Bansu Panyan by making a replica of the Sikada Diwa golden stool. The result of this spiritual violation of the Ashanti nation was the Ashanti Gaiman War, in which the Gaiamans were defeated. The Ashante Hine, and like I said, forgive me if I'm butchering this because my ancestors are Ashanti too, but like I said, they were brought over here as slaves and kept, I don't know how this, I don't know how to pronounce all this stuff. Like I'm over here with the Gentiles, we speak in English. All right, so. <laughs> The Ashantahena was said to have um, admired the craftsmanship of the replica Sika Diwa, which was adorned with various symbols, so much so that he forced the defeated Gaiman craftsmen to duplicate the symbols and also teach Ashanti craftsmen how to produce them themselves. So, so begins the Akan legacy of the Dinkra symbols. The Akan believed that the entire world is composed of two realms, the physical, which is the living, and the non-physical, which is the spirit. In their cosmology, there is no clear distinction between physical and spiritual. And I took this is from um, Yaba and Borale Ble, the Encyclopedia of African Religion, uh, edited by Mol Molefe Kete Asante and Ama Mazama, Volume One. All right, but we're gonna look at some more of these Indinkra symbols and show and give you some translations. All right, so here's some of the imagery of uh, Indinkra, and you can also see some translations for different symbols. As you look at this, you notice that they had a very high respect for the Most High and God, even though they, uh, their traditional religion, they corrupted you know, the Torah and corrupted true Yahweh worship and started blending in other things. But that's because they're the Israelites, 
and the Old Testament tells you that they started taking the in the Old Testament, the Israelites um, adopted the religions and the beliefs of their neighbors. They worshiped all the different gods, the Egyptian gods, the Moabite gods, the Ammonite gods, the Canaanite gods. OK, so that's why you're going to that's why anytime you find Israelites in Africa, you're also going to find similarities with them in ancient Egyptian culture. You're always going to find that because they worship the Egyptian gods at different times. And they spent so much time in Egypt, as we've discussed before many times. But you can look these over and you see a lot of these translations from these symbols deal with God. Like one of them here, S-A-Y-E, Duro, Sayo, the earth is heavier than the sea. All right, let me find one dealing with God. I read the, like this other one. Uh, this great panorama of creation dates back to time immemorial. No one lives who saw its beginning and no one will live to see its end except Naimbe, Naimi, okay? which is their word for the most high. All right, leave this up for a second, let y'all look at it, because it's giving you indinkra symbols and their translations of what they mean. So you see it is like a written language. All right, next we're gonna look at Boga Lafini. And like I said, we're just gonna look at a couple of them, but you can see they put it on cloth and you look at the symbols. The symbols look like the right, the symbols we, were, we saw with the proto Sinaitic text um, script with the Egyptian hieroglyphics. It looks similar to the cuneiform. You even looks similar to some forms of like Chinese and East Asian writings. Okay, these symbols too have meanings. Okay, boga lafini or bogalan, bambara for mud cloth, is a handmade Malayan cotton fabric traditionally dyed with fermented fermented mud. It has an important place in traditional Malayan culture and has more recently become a symbol of Malayan cultural identity. The cloth is being exported worldwide for use in fashion, fine art, and decoration. The technique is associated with several Malayan ethnic groups, but the Bombaran version has become the best known outside Mali. Excuse me. In the Bombaran language, the word boga lafini is a composite of bogo, meaning earth or mud, land, meaning with or by means of, and fini, meaning cloth. Although usually translated as mud cloth, bogolan actually refers to a clay slip with the high iron content that produces a black pigment when applied to hand spun and hand woven cotton textiles. Oh, that just reminded me, Audible. I read a New York Times article. My mom told me she used to eat uh, the red dirt clay in Mississippi. And this is the thing, my grandma, my wife's family, and stuff, this stuff we, you know, like they would eat, they, they would eat it. And then I found out that the slaves like used to eat it back in the day too, like just besides just for minerals. It's just something they do in Mississippi. And my mom's paternal line is Eva. Then I, they, I read a New York Times article from the 80s that was talking about how the slaves brought that over from Nigeria because there's parts of Nigeria where people eat the red dirt too. Boom. I was like, I did, that just made me think of that. That's learning on your way to learning and connecting, connecting us over here in the Americas to our Israelite ancestors over there in Africa, all right? Showing you that things from the cultures that we had in West Africa, we didn't lose everything. We did bring some stuff over here. All right. All right, here's an example of the Kikuyu script, Gikandi, all right? And it's hard. it was hard for me to find any images. These are only two things I could find. Um, and here's a diagram of what you're looking at on the side. But it was actually a way that the um, Kikuyu used to keep records of things and to even be able to tell a story. Um, I heard once that even a guy went to court with a with one of these long like sticks or something, and it had the, these same things, designs and cowrie shells on it. And he was able to tell them at the court how many times he had made different payments and things on his taxes from reading um, from reading the Gikandi. So it's like a form of writing all right so i'm just gonna leave this up here i actually find this one to be like one of the most interesting but i'm gonna leave it up for a second you can read this whole little thing that you're seeing it tells a whole long story all right and this one like i said i'm gonna leave up for a few more seconds so y'all can look at it unless you um well, too, y'all can it's 2019 you could pause it so pause it look at it study it observe it we're going to move on to the next slide. All right, here's another one just showing you the Huronco, which um, was developed by the Mande, the, uh, specifically the Yalunka, and um, Limba, which is a, a different group.
of people, not not mandate. But they're the ones who use this script. And you can see some of the designs here on cloth and shirts they made. All right. Leave this up for a second. Going to pause. And you can pause it. We're going to move on to the next slide. Because when we deal with the Ebo one, there is some, I we have to read some information about it. All right, and so now we're going to deal with the Igbo one, and like I said before, my mom's paternal um, ancestry is Igbo, and I did no DNA test. I just figured out everything with my family history through meticulous research, going different places, pulling up the records, doing different things, finding slave, finding my ancestors' slave narratives, but um, my mom's paternal ancestry is Igbo, meaning her father's 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 line. On her father's maternal line, you have um, Bakongo. You also have uh, Madagascar. We don't know if it's Malagasy or Bantu. It's probably a mixture of Bantu and Malagasy. And there's also a little bit of Irish in there on uh, my mother's father's mother's side. My mom's mom was Choctaw. All right. That's a Native American group. My dad's uh, paternal line was a Khan. All right. And they that's the only place they got the slaves from that um, on my paternal side that they came from and specifically the Ashanti. My dad's mother's line is what they call here like the triracial groups. She's just, she was just a mixture of like Irish, Scottish, freaking Choctaw, other Native, Amer other Native American groups and um, African slaves from, and, but yeah, I'm not going to get into that, but that's my background and all that stuff. So I do have a little bit of, I am going to say that I think this is the best script that was developed in Africa, but that's, I mean, developed in Western and Central and Southern Africa was this Igbo script, but that's because it's the most detailed. And, um, but let's read. Nisi Bidi, also known as Nisi Biri, Nichi Bidi, or Nichi Bidi, is a system of sim. Oh, and other groups use this besides the Igbo. So uh, before someone come at me, I already know. That lot, there's a few, a lot of the people who live in the Cross River area use this, not just the Igbo. So it's fine. And I make mention of that in the slide before somebody comes, oh, you're just doing it. You just focus on the Igbo, but other people use it. No, I know. Other people who are not Israelites as well used it. Other Hebraic groups who weren't Israelites and descendants of Can and um, the descendants of Canaanites. Because I did a lesson on the, I did a short little like 12 minute video on the effect. Because they were also uh, heavily involved in the slave trade. And their word, like the word efik, I think in Igbo, if I remember correctly, doing the lesson means like to like to oppress. But anyways, is a system of symbols indigenous to what is now southeastern Nigeria that are apparently pictograms. Though there have been suggestions that some are logograms or syllablograms. The symbols, excuse me, the symbols are at least several centuries old. Early forms appeared on excavated pottery, as well as what are most likely ceramic stools and headrests from the Calabar, Calabar region, with a range of dates from 400 to 1400 AD. There are thousands of Nisibi, of Nisibidi symbols, of which over 500 have been recorded. There were one, remember, there was a thousand, remember, there was a thousand symbols in the Egyptian hieroglyphs, right? And, and that little symbol on the right hand, at the bottom right hand corner, that's one of the uh, uh, symbols in the Nasidi written script. OK, there were once they were once taught in a school of children. Many of the signs deal with love affairs. Those that deal with warfare and the sacred are kept secret. Nisi Bidi is used on wall designs, calabashes, metals such as bronze, leaves, swords and tattoos. It is primarily used by the Ekpe Leopard Secret Society, also known as Nigbi or Igbo, which is found across Cross River among the Ikoi, Ifik, Igbo people, and other nearby peoples. All right. Okay, here are some examples of um, the Nisibidi writing so you can see how complex and detailed it was. The one over, the one all the way to the left, that's what the translation of it means. The name of a boy called Anua, as recorded by J.K. McGregor in 1909. 
So you see here that they did, the Igbo, the Afik, and other groups in southern and southeast Nigeria did have some form of writing. Okay? Leave this up for a second. Let y'all look at it. And I encourage y'all to go do your own more research on this stuff on your own. All right. This is the next to last slide. After this, we have only one more slide. Below are some examples of Nisi Bidi recorded by J.K. McGregor in 1909 and Elifa Stone Daryl 1910 and 1911 for the Journal of the Royal Anthro Anthropological Institute of Great Britain and Ireland and Man. Both of them recorded symbols from a variety of locations around the Cross River and especially the Ecom district in what is now Cross River State. Both of the writers used informants to retrieve Nisibidi that were regarded as secret and visited several Cross River communities. Okay, and that's another thing with a lot of these writing systems that a lot of our ancestors and it like this goes for all the Hebraic groups in Africa and even the ones who descend from the Canaanites. Um, we had secret societies and like priestly clans and a lot of stuff wasn't disseminated to the common people. And that's why even when it be like people on here are like, oh, you need to come to Africa and speak to the people in the village. If I go there, am I really going to get the secret? Am I really going to get the secret knowledge? Because a lot of y'all don't even know the full stuff of your own history. Like because it don't even get it don't get passed down like that. All right. A lot of the stuff was kept hidden. All right. So here you have a symbol for uh, Nisi Bidi. Welcome, two men talking, door, gun, crossbow, calabash, big drum, etik, natana, nisibidi, nisibidi's bunch of plantains when the head of the house wants plantains, he sends this sign to the head boy on the farm. <laughs> this is a written language. <laughs> like, I, I love this. Umbrella, toilet soap. Wow. Match it. Woman, man, moon, tortoise. Anyways, you can look at that, but look at this with them in Southeast Nigeria with a sophisticated writing system. And don't and like I said, this all started out with the Hebrews in Egypt, in southern Egypt, and in the Sinai Peninsula with the proto sinaitic script. All right, we have one more slide to look at. Just and the last slide we're going to look at just gives you a comparison of three different types of um, script that our ancestors used in Africa. All right, like in, in West Africa and Central, well, what would that be? Central West Africa? Basically Angola. We're going to see Angola, we're going to see Gikandi, so from the Kikuyu, that's East Africa. We're going to see Nisi Bidi um, symbols, you know, which is Nigeria, coming from the Ibu, the Ibo, the Afik, and other groups, the Ikoi. And then we're going to see, um, I don't know how to pronounce it, it's like Tusakana, which comes from Angola. All right, and then we'll be done. All right, last slide. And as you see here, some representative, some representative graphic systems for Nisi Bidi, um, that's Nigeria, that's the top row. Tukan, Tukan Asana, that's from Angola, that's the middle row. And then we have Gikandi, um, the Kenyan on the bottom. So you remember they also, so this is just showing you too that there was forms of writing that the Kikuyu had too. It wasn't just all on a, put on the stick or that instrument using cowrie shells and different things. Um, they also had script, okay? And it gives you the definitions of the words. You have, for Nisibidi, you have fire, intense love, uh, money, slave. Uh, and then for the uh, Tukasana and that comes from Angola, you have the symbol for lust, turtle, judging, friendship. And then in Gikandi, for the Kikuyu, you have the um, symbols for audience, arrow, field, tongs. So anyways, hope y'all, this was informative. Hope y'all were blessed by the lesson. I'm going to leave this up for a little second so that y'all can, um, you know, observe it if you need to. Shalom. Hopefully I will see y'all for our Sabbath lesson tomorrow, Friday night Bible study at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. You can catch it live streaming on YouTube or you can catch it live streaming on our website. Just click the um, tab at the top of the website that says Sabbath Live. And our website is www.firstresurrectionfellowship.com. And you can also catch our Sabbath lesson this Saturday, or our Sabbath class this Saturday at noon Pacific Standard Time as well. Same thing. 
live streaming, just click Sabbath Live tab on www.firstresurrectionfellowship.com or you can catch us live streaming on YouTube as well. All right, shalom and have a blessed rest of your evening.